everybody. Welcome to this fourth food design webinar. I am so excited. The title of this fourth food design webinar is Designing Food Future. I am Dr. Francesca Zampollo. I am the founder of the online school of food design. And I thought it would have been a great idea to organize a virtual uh, meeting point where the food design community can learn what food design is from food design experts. So this is the reason, this is the underlying, uh, the, the goal for this series of food design webinars. This is the fourth, and my guest today is Lin Yi Yuan, editor of MOLD. I am so excited to have you, Lin Yi. I can't even tell you. Please tell, tell everybody who still doesn't know impossibly who, who you are and who, what MOLD is. Uh, please tell us. Hi, Francesca. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for having me with you today. Um, my name is Lin Yi. I am based here in New York City. Uh, this is my kitchen in Brooklyn right now. And I'm the founder and editor of Mold, which is an online platform for food design. Um, I don't, I'm not a designer myself, but I'm a journalist and I've been writing about uh, art and culture and design for the past 15 years. First of all, I love it that you are in your kitchen. <laughs> it is so spot on. Well done. Uh, thank you, Lin. It's so exciting for me to have you here because I'm a huge fan of Mold, um, which is, by the way, if you haven't um, seen it already, is this is mold.com. Uh, please go. It's an awesome, awesome um, blog of food design platform that any every food designer should be uh, a regular um, visitor. Um, I just want to welcome you all, uh, welcome all of you who are joining us for this live event. Uh, welcome and please just join the chat room and let Lin Yi and I know where you are from, where you are connecting from and what is your uh, interest in food design, where about you are in your life with regards to food design and of course if at any time you have questions for myself or most importantly for Lin Yi, just let us know and send us a, a message in the chat room. Um, if you guys, you guys uh, who are watching this live should be in the um, online school of food design, um, food design website web page. So, sorry, food design webinars web page, and the chat room is just underneath the screen where you see Lin Yi and I talking. And if you don't see it, just hit refresh, and you should see it. Fantastic. I also want to um, say hello and welcome to anybody who is watching the, this as a replay uh, and all those of you who are listening to this as a podcast. Um, again, guys from the podcast area, uh, if in the future you want to join the live food design webinars and see us talking and interact with the live chat, just go on the online school of foodesign.org, find the food design webinars webpage and sign in to have access to the exclusive uh, live webinars and, most, and also to the replays of past webinars. Fantastic. So I think I've said all my hello and welcome. Um, and I just really want to go uh, back to you, Lin Yi, who are the here, should be, I want you to be the hero of this food design webinar. And I just want to hear from you and learn anything, everything that you have to say. So really my first question to you is, as you said, you don't have a design a background and you don't have a food background. So what was your first approach with food design? When did you first hear the words food design and how did you fall in love with it? Great question, Francesca. So I'm actually showing you a picture right now of the, the project that actually sparked my imagination. It's a Philips uh, micro uh, bio digester. Um, and it was a white paper that the Phillips Group put out um, to explore the idea of the future kitchen. And the idea is that it's a uh, kitchen island that you can kind of chop food on. Um, you put food waste into the, uh, this um, copper sill that's underneath the sink. And as the food waste composts, it releases gas to power a light that is above the kitchen island and also power the cooktop that is attached to the kitchen island. And this was something that um, Phillips put out as like a kind of provocation for what the future uh, kitchen of the future might look like. Um, this 
project was something that was so beautiful and elegant and kind of drew on the best technologies of both the past and the present um, to reimagine um, the way that we could live and, uh, and, and the way that products can help us create these kind of closed life cycles um, for both energy efficient energy and also with food. Um, so this was kind of the first project that sparked my imagination. Um, at the time, I was basically a uh, an editor for a website called Core 77, which is an industrial design research uh, resource online that's been publishing um, stories about industrial design for 20 years. And I was traveling around the world going to different um, design festivals and I would see these really interesting projects um, primarily from students that were kind of taking ideas around product design and applying them to our kind of interaction and relationship with food and these projects really sparked my imagination and I realized that there really wasn't um, an editorial platform like in the design world that was taking these projects very seriously um, within the context of design festivals, which are typically a lot of furniture and lighting and interior objects. Um, these food design projects didn't really get very much press. And then when they did appear in um, design websites, they were kind of ghettoized. It was not really a, a, a main story. Um, and then I realized that sometimes these projects would appear in food press, but it was always in this very, um, misunderstood way where uh, the food press would be like, oh, isn't this idea so crazy? And um, that also didn't seem really appropriate for the level of thoughtfulness and consideration that these designers were putting into their projects. So I thought, well, with my love of food and my understanding of product design, um, it seemed like I would be a really great uh, person to, I, I just figured I should start a website dedicated to uh, giving a rigorous platform um, and rigorous consideration to these types of food design projects. It's interesting, it's interesting that you say that, that uh, um, um, you, you, you approach the, or you, you found out about the food design world through student <laughs> projects. And that is, as you are noticing, if you have noticed and, uh, yourself, and as you can see still now, um, so many of the projects, products, services that uh, the media talk about come from uh, students, so uh, uh, university uh, projects, school projects. Um, what do, why do you think that is? Why do you think that the most interesting, I mean, I have my opinion, but I'm going to shut up on this. Uh, but I'm going to ask you on the other hand, and put you on the spot maybe. Why do you think that the major, the vast majority of the very cool stuff that is done on food design is done at the, um, from students and not from food design professionals or food design brands, food, uh, sorry, food companies and food brands? Sure. Well, I mean, you know, obviously students don't have any of the, real life uh, kind of um, parameters that uh, professional designers or brands have to contend with. I mean, you know, imagine as a brand, like when you're designing packaging, for example, it's not just, you know, designing the most sustainable, beautiful um, packaging. It's about like, how does it sit on the shelf? I mean, well, how does it ship from one place to another? Does it meet FDA requirements uh, in the United States, at least? And how does it look on the shelf? Um, there are certain parameters with, you know, even like, you know, display on supermarket shelves, like height, width, weight, um, colors, schemes, all these different things are real considerations that uh, commercial and professional designers have to really contend with. Whereas students don't really have those limitations and really the sky's the limit. Um, you know, they're definitely working under different, uh, they're different parameters. And, and I think that for that reason, a lot of student work tends to be very aspirational. Um, uh, you know, we are very interested in looking at projects that look towards how design can shape the future of food. And so for that reason, uh, we do feature um, a handful of student projects, but um, that in general, I, I love student projects for the aspiration of them, but I'm very much interested in how the 
the kind of kernel of an idea translates into a real world context, um, how these kind of aspirational ideas can really spark change at a mass level or at, at least a commercial level on some, uh, in some ways. I, I, I agree. I agree with you. You gave also a very polite answer, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, I would have really gone, gone for it, but well done. Uh, I mean, uh, as you say, as, as you say with other words, um, sometimes really freedom is the best uh, ingredient for creativity and uh, constraints. Um, I mean, they are constraints. They, are, they have a perfect word, constraints. Um, so tell us more about how Mold specifically was born. Um, what, maybe where the name itself come from, very interesting name. And uh, maybe the evolution from where you started uh, and, and how you looked at food design um, and the type of stories that you looked for when you started and maybe how things are now. Sure. Um, well, the idea for mold kind of came about, and I really just kind of had it turning around in my head for about two years, um, thinking about what it would, what the shape of the the project would be, um, how was I going to execute it. Um, it was definitely born as a personal project, so um, you know, there was questions about like, you know what is there what type of money I needed to personally invest into building the website and um, just thinking a little bit of even just about the name and so the name was interesting because I went through like probably like 15 or 20 different ideas for names and the idea for mold really stuck because um, I wanted the website to be provocative um, I feel that it, it, there's, it was a little bit reactionary in the sense that a lot of food websites um, have this kind of precious uh, art direction. So it's like this kind of soft, glowy light, you know, this very minimal, warm kitchen, you know, food shot from above. It's all pretty consistently boring in my mind. And so... I felt like, well, with a, word, a, a name like Mold, which is kind of decidedly anti-food, it really kind of sets out from the front end of things to be like, no, Mold is not a food website. It's actually a design website. And um, as those who of you who are turning, tuning in, like most of you are probably designers. And so obviously creating a Mold is something that is part of an industrial process. And um, I wanted to really speak a little bit to that. And also about the kind of transformative nature of natural molds um, in our relationship with food. So sometimes we're like, uh, oh, moldy bread, we can't eat that, so we throw it out. But moldy cheese is delicious. And so there's kind of this idea of um, shifting our perspective a little bit around our relationship with food. Um, I, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, I was just about to say uh, a thumbs up for Gongorzola. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> love a, I love a good blue cheese. <laughs> uh, uh, it's very inspirational. That, that's, a, that's a fantastic story. So um, is, was there a shift in your way to look at food design from the beginning to the end, you think? Absolutely. So Not the end. I mean, just now, not the end. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping it's not the end. We're just beginning, Francesca. Um, I think that, you know, when I started out, I was really, I, it was very broad. I mean, I still think that our editorial coverage is pretty broad. Um, it, it, you know, anything that had to do with food, anything that had to do with design um, was kind of, we would write about it. And I still think that right now the editorial coverage is, touches a lot of different things from food and art to um, you know, designing food systems, to designing the plate itself and what's on the plate. Um, and then as I started just writing more regularly, um, I came across some really interesting projects. Um, one which was from an Australian graphic designer named Gemma Warner. And it was really, it was about uh, kind of the global food crisis and how the United Nations has predicted by the year 2050, there will be more people on this earth than we can feed. So we literally will not be able to produce enough calories to feed all of the people who will be populating this earth. And that is completely terrifying considering that even now when we actually can produce enough calories, there's still major issues with global hunger 
and um, nutrition, the nutritional value of the food that we eat. And with the idea that designers um, by nature are problem solvers, I was like, well, clearly this is like the most urgent problem in food design is for designers to really think about how do we take the tools of design and apply them to the myriad issues with this global coming impending global food crisis like you know 2050 is just around the corner um all of us you know god willing will be here when that date hits and so we as um, citizens and designers need to actively address this urgent um and really kind of catastrophic uh issue and so that's kind of the how the content has evolved. And so personally, I am much more interested in all the different scales of design as um, problem solving this specific urgent issue. I mean, it's, it's massive, obviously. And it goes from, you know, micro scale to as far as like, what are the nutrients that we're absorbing in our body? How do we design food itself to be absorbed in ways into our body that um, takes less energy to grow, but also you know is going to feed us more nutritionally to huge, massive scale, which is like how do we redesign, you know, you know, industrial agriculture? I mean, obviously that's like a giant problem that cannot be solved by a single designer alone, but it's something that I think that we should all be. Um, it, it should all be in our. In our in our perspective we should all be considering that those types of questions yeah thank you so much uh, this is uh, it's really um uh, this is you're touching upon the thing that i like probably yeah probably the thing that i like the most about uh mold you don't you, you don't just talk about food design um but you talk about the real food design uh, as you said um well, this this is what designers can do. This is what designers uh, designers are supposed to solve problems. So you are you are you are you and your platform. You understand, and your platform shows that food design is about solving problems, but it can really be about solving the big problems, which is exactly what we are supposed to do because we have so many of them, and we can just maybe put aside the. Uh, new salt and pepper shaker or the new, I don't know, uh, sandwich or uh, chips flavor or, you know. Uh, so this is really the thing I like the most about a mold that is not just, it's not wishy-washy stuff. You talk about the big stuff too. I like the really important uh, view uh, that you have on sustainability. And with these regards, I wanted to ask you, um, if you have noticed, what is the trend that you have noticed um, uh, from food designers who approach um, product, the design of food products or food services or food events, uh, hopefully with a, a sustainability perspective, but also uh, if you have noticed a trend, a change in the perspective of the public, who are those who ultimately uh, read your um, your uh, platform, your blog, and uh, if they ha if their perspective possibly requests uh, for articles that are about uh, sustainability and food design, um, have you have you noticed any trend like this? Sure, I think this is a really great question. Um, but before I answer, I just want to also just mention. Um, you know, I, I do think that uh, designers should spend a lot of time and energy to think about solving for large issues. But like, I also think that it's important for designers to like follow their passion. So like, for example, if your passion is um, creating new chip flavors or, um, you know, designing the ultimate sandwich, uh, go for it. Like there's nothing, um, I think that's wonderful. And there's, there's room for all of those types of passions. Because, for example, maybe that chip flavor, for example, will help us embrace a new kind of food in the future uh, that will be, you know, more sustainable to grow, that will be able to feed it more people, but it may not be something that's necessarily palatable for uh, industrialized countries, like, for example, seaweed or um, insects or, uh, you know, some sort of like mushroom protein. So all of this, I think there's space uh, in 
all of this for um, all different types of designers. Uh, I think the idea is just to really keep in mind that these kind of magical designer tools uh, can be used for helping to solve some big questions, big problems as well. Um, and as far as sustainability is concerned, um, you know, I think that all designers um, are trained to think about like a life cycle assessment, right? So when you, when you, especially when you're an industrial designer, you think about uh, when you make a product, like where is it going? You, you think about where does the material come from? Um, and then where is it, when it goes into the trash, like what's gonna happen to it? And at least that's the ideal. Um, I think within the food design space, um, this story specifically about the original Umberpacht, which is um, Berlin's first zero waste grocery store, has been a huge um, and influential story on mold. I think that people are really interested in how um, both from like a commercial perspective, uh, we can really rethink uh, packaging in the grocery store. But from a consumer perspective, I think consumers are really starting to demand this uh, more and more. I know here in New York, we have um, what's called a CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture. And so every week, you know, I go to a meeting point with my neighbors who are also part of the CSA. And we, um, you know, pick up our food and um, we bring our own grocery bags uh, here to, um, you know, use to, 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 to pick up food. So I don't really use grocery bags anymore, which is great. Um, I would love to be able to go around the corner to my local deli and buy, you know, pasta, rice, all these things without, also without using additional packaging. Um, it's, I think that, you know, this kind of interest in uh, zero waste solutions um, is very much kind of in the zeitgeist uh, from like, you know, going to eat at like a restaurant that's really like, you know, they talk about uh, animal butchery uh, from like nose to tail butchery or with vegetables even using the entire vegetable and also thinking about, you know, composting both in the commercial level, but also, you know, personal level here in New York, we only recently started picking up uh, food waste as compost. And so that's a pretty transformative thing. So um, I think, you know, zero waste is something that is uh, extremely, um, people are very, very interested in it. Um, IDEO, uh, they have an open innovation platform called Open IDEO. And they just recently launched a really interesting uh, kind of open call for crowdsourced ideas around how to reduce food waste. And the outpouring of ideas was like very interesting. Um, you know, not everybody on, who's participates on that platform is a designer, uh, which I think is great and I think is important. And um, what was interesting to me about the ideas that came out on that platform was that so many of them were kind of like community centered. So it was about like, teaming up with your neighbors, with um, people in your schools, in your churches, in your communities to uh, come together and like create different kind of solutions around food waste, whether it's like sharing food or um, collecting food waste for composting or um, kind of identifying partners within retail and uh, commercial partners to, to help alleviate food waste. All of these things were really interesting to me. Um, so I think that part of that part of the qu equation about sustainability is really interesting. But also, I really I really love the idea about food, which is a compostable material, uh, to be um, a potentially transformative um, uh, material for the future. Um, we wrote this really great story about um, how mushrooms might be the next great building material. And um, I'll share it with you guys right now. Hold on, let me see. Um, but, you know, we, I think that a, a lot of people might be f familiar with Ecovative. Um, they are using mushroom mycelium to reimagine packaging. Um, they're also building, uh, they're, they're building compostable structures using mushroom mycelium as well in agricultural waste. And so I think that, you know, 
this is just one very small example about how food is a, like a very transformative um, material for for the future uh, and so that's another I kind of um, touch stone around sustainability definitely um, I yeah I um, I love your the, the example that you showed and the way you, um, you and, and the way you see these um, um, offer and demand in a way uh, of, yeah. of, of, of a, a sustainability approach with food design what's happening okay sorry I, th I thought Google was kind of going crazy okay <laughs> um, so I love also that you showed us projects and I think I like it so much and I think it's um, a project and therefore articles that uh, are present in the in mold um, um, maybe we can um, I'd like to uh, ask you to show us more actually of those so maybe uh, do you have do you want to show us uh, quickly uh, or tell us about quickly uh, let's say three of the um, uh, topics around food design that you have liked the most uh, lately and therefore the uh, that for which there are articles in mold and um, and I know and I know the website has uh, you guys look at uh, both um, either um, products or, or events or, or uh, processes so just choose whichever you want sure well I think the first uh, story I'm going to share with you is actually one of the most popular stories on the website and it's about um, it's actually also one of the early inspirations uh, for the website and it's um, it's about this book called Fabric Fabrica Proprio and it was a book that was put together by a design writer and some designers in Lisbon. And it was basically really investigating this idea of Portuguese pastries as an industrial product. And so they basically kind of broke down the process of producing these wide array of pastries on a daily basis in these tiny little bakery cafes around Lisbon. And they realize that it's really an industrial thing, like, you know, scale on a regular basis is insane. Um, so what I did is um, one of the first things, stories we published was about kind of going around Lisbon with one of the writers and kind of looking at all the different types of unique pastries that pop up around Lisbon and um, how they're made, uh, a little bit about their history um, and how these bakers over the years have kind of perfected this industrial process of producing um, uh, these kind of pastries on a daily basis. Um, if I really recommend anybody to uh, check out the book, I like I have it all the time, and it's on my coffee table. It's like it's beautiful. Um, so it that's also one of looks quite mouth watering, which might it be is dangerous. Not <laughs> but I just love it because, you know, there's everything from like, you know, just these kind of like uh, process shots to kind of a like almost like a taxonomy of pastries uh, that you can find at these, uh, these bakeries around Lisbon and uh, tells you kind of like the details of what they're made out of and uh, they're kind of like proportions, the form itself, it's, it's beautiful. So that's one of the first um, kind of stories that inspired uh, me to start Mold. Um, another uh, thing that I think is really important that may not be as, uh, so people may not be as aware of in Europe and other places, is this idea of small scale farming in the United States. So um, in the United States, uh, we are kind of like the, the, we, we, the United States obviously has a history of being the um, kind of uh, instigator for industrial agriculture. And um, now there's obviously a trend for younger farmers and smaller farmers to, like, you know, uh, for consumers to support smaller farms, like I mentioned community supported agriculture earlier. Um, I think one of the biggest problems is the fact that a lot of small scale to medium scale farms, they don't actually have tools designed specifically for their needs. Like most of the tools that you can buy in the United States as a farmer are uh, for industrial scale. So um, this was a story that we did where we reported on an event uh, that happens here in um, upstate New York at a beautiful uh, research 
working farm called Stone Barns. And we did a little report on some of the new tools that uh, there, this group of, it's called, the idea is called slow tools, that are working towards uh, creating um, new tools for small to medium scale farmers. Um, and I think this is something that people who are interested in industrial design, who are interested in design engineering, can really kind of grab onto and think about because you know small to medium scale farming is somewhat automated but there's a lot of kind of physical and manual labor that's is still involved and anything that we can do as designers to um, kind of help small to medium scale farmers to be more productive is going to help the food system overall and provide some new types of alternatives um, for more sustainable ways of farming and um, healthier uh, you know, kind of letting us escape this kind of monoculture that we currently live with in, in our food system. So this is like a story that I think is really important and also just something that I think a lot of people don't actually ever think about um, that, you know, a lot of the tools that small to medium scale farmers in the United States have at their disposal are actually being imported from places like the Netherlands and from France and Italy. Uh also. <laughs> can I can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Um, first of all, this is another thing that I love about uh, mold that you understand that talking about farming is talking about food design because mm. yes, and I think this uh, this might still be a new uh, perspective on food design for most people. Uh, design can be applied to farming as well. Farming is about food ultimately, so design can be applied to farming as well. And I love that you guys understand that. Uh, my question, on the other hand, is: uh, Do these farmers, for example, this specific project that you're talking about, um, uh, farmers or whoever else was behind the creation of this project, um, was the, were these people aware that they were do, of the fact that they were doing design? Was there a, a, a designer that was saying, I'm a designer and I know that I'm doing design? Or did they just do design without knowing that they were designing? That's a great question. Um, yes and no. So the, the project was initiated by farmers themselves who were in need of tools, but they worked with design engineers to actually design and create the tools to be ergonomic, um, and I say design engineers because there's obviously a lot of kind of, um, you know, like uh, engineering questions to solve when you're talking about farming as a whole and also like machinery. Um, what was awesome is at, at this farm, it's called Stone Barns, where this conference was held, there's, actually, there's also a uh, restaurant called Blue Hill. And so it's, uh, it's um, the, the farm and the restaurant work collaboratively to kind of think about what's on the plate itself. And so the reason why I found out about this project was because I did a tour of the farm and they showed me a composter that is like an industrial composter that they have in a barn. And what they actually do is they run copper coiling through this composter and because compost has a pretty steady heat heat like a uh, temperature the water in the coils that are run through the composter are heated up by the decomposing food waste and then they the water comes back out into a bath and the chefs actually sous vide meats and vegetables in this warm water bath that is being um, maintained by passive energy uh, of the composter. Um, and that was such an inspiring idea and project that I was like, this is amazing. Who, who did this? What is this? Tell me more. And that's when I learned that there was a working group that was working specifically um, with the farmers on addressing some of these issues. Oh, so that is fantastic to hear. Um, without interrupting you, well, I have already interrupted you, but you were <laughs> about to show us uh, another project, I think, or not? Yes. The last okay. project I wanted to show you is also about, a little bit about growing food, but it's, um, in my mind, it's really about uh, kitchen appliances. And it's a recent project that was kickstarted called Sprouts IO. It came out of MIT Media Lab um, from an architect who actually kind of 
was inspired by architectural living walls um, that are, you know, uh, that are basically like vegetation. And she was like, well, why can't we create personal produce that is like a smart personal produce? So this is basically what, in my mind, um, a key appliance for the future. So you will have your toaster, your water kettle, electric water kettle. For me, I have a rice cooker, and this would be like maybe the fourth thing that I buy for my kitchen. And it's a, it's a, it's a, like a tiny, smart growing pod. It's like a little, a little farm for your kitchen. And the idea is that, you know, there's a couple of these on the market already. And I think that that's great. And I think that it's important. But what I think is going to really change the way that we relate to our food is actually making it really easy for consumers to just grow the things that they want to eat, kind of like let it just do work for itself. And so this little um, lighting kind of head right here also has sensors in it and a video monitor that actually monitors the growth and health of your plants and adjusts nutrients being delivered into the uh, water and soil uh, accordingly. Um, this is a prototype that was uh, early on. Um, but I do think that this idea of, you know, kind of taking like creating a more personalized relationship with our food. Um, this is a little time lapse of your 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 microgreens growing. Um, it's going to really transform how much how we eat and what we eat because all of a sudden you're like, oh, you know what? I take pride in growing this, and you also kind of get to like look at the secret life of plants, which is amazing and beautiful and very poetic. Um, so I think that all these things. Um, really get me excited. I mean, just thinking about, you know, let's say you really like peppery rocket, right? Like I love arugula. It's like one of my most favorite things. With these types of um, appliances, you'll be able to kind of adjust uh, these things to your taste. Maybe you like mint that is a, has a little bit of like a kick to it. So perhaps in the future, you can actually just like push a little button and be like, I want to grow mint that has like a little bit more nitrogen so that it'll be a little spicier. I don't know. You know, there's just a lot of possibilities that these types of projects can um, are opening the doors to. And it really touches on a lot of trends right now. Um, connected home, um, you know, wellness, um, you know, just kind of like big data, like taking the, the power of a lot of different data points and uh, creating um, algorithms that actually work for us. And I think those things are all really uh, interesting. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think, um, I think uh, this is something that was embedded in what, in what you said. Projects like these are in a way educational because as yeah. you said, they really bring us closer to the raw material the yes. food itself and see as you said it gives us we have a chance to look at the secret life of food i love that um and that is really what we need because maybe for some people it is easy to shift from supermarket to uh, uh urban garden um, sure. for, for some other uh it's it's uh unpractical or um, a step a step still too far from their uh, day to day life and, and i think something like that that stays on the on your kitchen counter and you can look at it and smell it every day um i think pro projects like these as you said are really um day after day they are going to show us how important it is that we get closer to food and I maybe agree. we can't all have a, a rooftop garden yet or a, or a urban garden that we share with um, with the um, neighbors. Uh, but maybe we can all have our mint that grows happily uh, in our in our kitchen on our kitchen counter. Absolutely. I mean, there's I think most people don't know where they're I mean, I don't know where my food comes from. Like, uh, you know, I think a lot of people in the United States don't eat vegetables and fruits because um, a, maybe that there's no access to those types of things. And maybe if there is access, the food and vegetables aren't that great. So I think that there's a lot of um, challenges and barriers to kind of eating in a way that is connected um, both to the food and to where it came from. Um, so just having these types of uh, appliances that are going to be more accessible in the near future and um, 
like you said, like, you know, on our counter every day, like, it's so exciting to be like, oh, you know what, like, I actually grew that thing, and it's going to be delicious, like, I know it's going to be delicious, so that's, that's transformative. That uh, it absolutely is transformative. Is the is the good word? Is uh, is the perfect word? Okay, I think uh, I want to shift to uh, we have um to our uh, f uh, followers, how should, uh, how our viewers? I don't know. Uh, we have a couple of questions. So we have Eric from Berlin, I believe, now Munich. Yes, uh, who is asking you? Um, and and this relates to uh, you being the uh, the edit founder and editor of Mold. Uh, how? Uh, how does uh, Linyi get informed about new concepts? Do the projects, or I think probably designers, provide information and photos? Question mark. Yes. So, sorry, Eric, I totally missed this question. Um, you are busy talking, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we get our kind of stories from a number of different ways. Um, I definitely kind of like scour a lot of different sources on a regular basis from food science websites to design websites to food websites for different story ideas. Um, you can also email me, editors with an S, E-D-I-T-O-R-S, at thisismold, M-O-L-D, dot com. We get a lot of really great pitches on a regular basis, so um, please, say hello and send um, images, pitch ideas, tell us about the projects that you're working on, um, all of these things. Like our hope is that, you know, that the website will really be a platform and a community for people who are interested in food design. So thank you for asking. Uh, definitely. And then we have a question from Eva. Um, I think this, this relates to when we were talking about this specific uh, mini kitchen farm. Um, what about home insect farms? I don't know if, you, if she's asking whether you know about them, whether you have yeah. already written about them. There is a really great um, insect farm. It's a mealworm farm that uh, was actually kickstarted by a friend of ours, um, this woman, Katarina Unger. Uh, she is an industrial designer who was really interested in the kind of potential of insects to, um, you know, feed the protein, the, you know, the potential for insects to really feed people. Um, so this project is, I think, the first commercial um, uh, insect farm available uh, through Kickstarter. Um, and so this is, I, I'll, sh I'll kind of play this little video, which is pretty awesome. When I created um, Mealworm a few years back. Well, you guys can play it, but um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Like, I think that there is a lot of potential for uh, insect farms to uh, be popular, but there's definitely like any sort of living thing like uh, chickens or, um, fish even like there's a there's there's things that are not that appealing about uh, growing your own insects uh, for protein but I do think it's um, something that has a lot of potential that's right you know right there for us um, and, and will the also itself is changing as well with regards absolutely. to absolutely slowly absolutely. but it is changing for luckily for yeah, those of you who eat animal protein I don't know I'm vegetarian slash vegan but to the those of you who eat animal protein, insects might be the future. Sorry. No, I agree. And I do think that they are the future. Like, I think that there's so much potential in insects. And this is where design comes in, right? Like, design can come in and help us as West, like, people, I, I, and I say us loosely because I don't know where everybody's coming from, but here in New York, in Europe, um, the United States, um, these play, this insects are things that can really transform our protein sources and designers can kind of be there to help us shape what form those insects are going to be coming in. Um, you know, how, whether it's through packaging design or designing the food itself, like how are we going to get our friends, our neighbors to kind of buy into this idea of insects as a really incredible, nutritious, alternative form of protein. Fantastic. Um, we have to wrap up, but I have a couple of questions that I want to ask you. Maybe we can answer more or less uh, quickly. Let's just see what happens. Um, um, first of all, I just I, this is a question that I always want to ask uh, my uh, foods and experts. Uh, so, Lin, Lin Yi, what is your definition of food design? Great. Um, my definition of food design is using food as a material for designing objects or designing experiences around food. 
Um, so that includes uh, this, this growing systems that we actually grow our food in, that includes how do we transport food from one place to another, to grocery store buying, to uh, designing meals. Um, you know, there's a lot of really amazing experiential uh, restaurants that can transform the way that we think about food. And, um, you know, we were talking about uh, Blue Hill earlier, and they did this really great waste, um, like a zero waste, not zero waste, but like no waste food dining experience that really brought that conversation into fine dining culture. Um, you know, I, yeah, so, and, and that also includes, uh, as, as Ava mentioned, Lab Burgers, um, which, uh, you know, we talked, that we wrote a story recently about Impossible Burger, which is a new idea around uh, alternative proteins. And what I think is so powerful about it is that it's not creating a veggie burger that is like, you know, good as a veggie burger. It's actually taking the molecular structure of beef and protein and building backwards uh, at a molecular level using plant proteins versus animal proteins and creating a product that meat eaters actually want to eat because it actually tastes like meat. It's not a, it's not like a substitute for meat. It just, it tastes like it's actually like a burger. It actually bleeds when you cut into it. And I think that as designers, as engineers, as scientists, um, obviously the, the future is a collaborative future and so that we all need to kind of work together to think about um, how to, to address these types of things like alternative meats, like eating insects, like, um, you know, uh, where our food comes from. And so all those things I think are really important. Yeah, and it's fantastic to know that uh, more and more, uh, they were doing that more and more, food designers are doing that more and more. And most importantly, is it's, it's, it's fantastic that there's a platform like yours that informs everybody that things are, are happening. Um, one, uh, um, one thing that I wanted to touch upon, uh, mold, if you go on the, on the website, on the blog, uh, like it's a um, sentence, line, I don't know what the phrase, catchphrase, I don't know what, it, what to call it, is designing food futures, which also happens to be the title of this, uh, coincidentally uh, is the title of this food design webinar. Um, why, what, 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 what is behind the choice of this sentence? Yeah, I, thanks for asking. I, you know, designing food futures is really about um, placing design at the center of our editorial mission and um, like I was mentioning about kind of the coming food crisis, I believe that um, by talking about it as designing food futures, it's like, okay, our current system is broken in a lot of ways. The fact that we can't feed everybody in 30 years is terrifying. So how can design actually change that equation so that we can have a more just food system? Like I, I think food justice is really important and that includes the way that humans are treated within our food system, um, whether it's like through labor or actually people who are, like what we put in our bodies is actually nutritious and that there's a kind of guarantee of that versus just eating things that are just addictive and making us eat, want to eat and buy more of those addictive, non-nutritious things. I think those things are really important to kind of ask ourselves um, as designers and as consumers, like, where that responsibility lays. And also for things to be beautiful, like designers have this unique gift of, um, you know, making things elegant, making them beautiful, making them aspirational. And I think that all of those elements are really important in thinking about how we eat and drink in the future. All, we need to continue on that path. We can't be eating these like, like food shakes. We can't eat like brown blocks of nothing. Like we need to like make these things, um, desirable and delightful like food is the most enjoyable delightful experience that we get to participate in three times sometimes i participate in it six times a day like it's it's amazing and so we need to continue to like feed that very human part of our ourselves 
Thank you so much, Olinyi. I I have fallen in love with you. You speak very <laughs> beautiful words. You have very elegant and to the point uh, ways of explaining uh, things. And your perspective on food design is unique and it's necessary and it should be shared. So I'm really happy that uh, this food design webinar has been a little as has done. Um, a little bit more, a little, it was a little help in uh, sharing your thoughts and your perspective even more. Um, the last question that I want to ask you, uh, since we are talking about future, uh, but now from a different perspective, uh, since uh, a lot of the audience that I have um, are uh, either young food designers or people who want to start uh, um, their career in food design, um, what is your... Um, what, what is your advice for future food designers, for those who want to start <clears throat> a career in food design and for those who will be the future of food design? The, thanks. Um, well, I think that you're in the right field. So applause to you if you're participating in today's conversation. Um, I think my biggest piece of advice is to really uh, like learn the, the foundational tools of design. Um, those are so powerful. Um, designers, uh, whether you're an industrial designer, you're um, designing systems, you're designing for social change, you're a food designer, all these kind of found these design um, fields have a foundation in problem solving and design thinking and um, thinking of like looking at the world through the lens of design. So really kind of uh, honing in on your design tools, I think, are very important. The second thing I think that is really important for future food designers is I believe that food design is uniquely positioned to um, kind of exemplify the importance of designing for scale and designing in a collaborative fashion. Because uh, no matter what you're doing in food design, you're going to probably collaborate with a design engineer, a chef, a farmer, a nutrition design, a, a food nutritionist. There's um, so many different people with incredible wells of knowledge that you can tap into. So I think food designers in particular um, really need to learn the tools of collaboration and design collaboration and let design lead that collaboration. I think that's another kind of piece of it that I think is really important. So um, Godspeed and send me uh, your projects. That's another really important step to all of this. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, thank you so much, Lini. And I swear, everybody, I did not ask Lini. I did not uh, ask Lini to uh, to answer this way. But since you, uh, this, since this one, it was your answer. I just want to remind everybody that the on, this is exactly what the online school of food design is giving you. Uh, um, uh, the one of the courses of the online school of food design is the design in food design, and really gives you. <clears throat> excuse me the tools to understand design, to learn how to do design, and to learn how to be a designer uh, that collaborates with other people. And that is, is really one of the key points of the course. And I swear again, I did not ask Lini to say this, but since she really gave it to me on a silver platter, I just had to, I just had to mention the course. Um, uh, and, and just since I'm saying this, uh, to those of you who are approaching um, food design for the first time, or are not really sure yet whether this is what you want to do and what the this is your career. Um, the online school of food design also has an amazing, uh, if I may say so myself, a free course called Food Design 101, which is an, an email course. So you receive six lessons by emails directly in your inbox, uh, which are six steps for you to understand food design very well, I believe, and, uh, and to become a food designer. So your first tools to become a food designer. Okay, having said that, um, I saw um, Eric from Munich asked you a question, uh, Lini, to which you are answering in the chat, but just for everybody, he was asking you if you have any plans to write a book. I don't know if you have plans to write a book, but I know you have plans for something else that is tangible, tangible and printed. Correct. Yeah. Um, so no plans for writing a book, um, but we are putting together our first print magazine issue that will be coming out spring of 2017. Um, it's going to be a finite run of six printed magazines beginning with uh, May of 2017. And the first issue will be about designing for the human microbiome. So that means designing for our guts. 
um, I think historically and in, in lots of different kind of uh, healing traditions, our guts have been considered our second brain. Um, I think that a lot of uh, different healing traditions, including like Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, all kind of look at our gut health as a very essential part of whole human health. And so my challenge to designers is how do you take some of the newer scientific knowledge that's coming out around our microbiome and apply it to uh, the challenge of um, you know food security and, and and wellness for food security for all but wellness for the individual so that's going to be our big project for spring of 2017. Um, thank you so much Lini I'm just reading this there's more people coming up thank you Ivana Carmen as well who has been following us um, I think I think it, we have been talking for a, a lot of time, uh, more than we were pl planning. But I think that that's what happens when you talk about stuff that you love, that you enjoy, and most importantly, when you talk, when you talk, when I get to talk with people that are just brilliant. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Lin Yi, for your time and for um, really sharing it with with us who you are and what mold is and thank you really for putting mold together thank you for quitting your previous job <laughs> and for uh investing uh time and resources into this platform it's amazing and it deserves a lot of success uh even more than what you already have so um lots of good wishes uh, from the future i'm always your number one fan and reader and i will be spreading the word even more um so thank you everybody who was following us live uh, you've been great it was great to talk to you in the chat room uh, thank you to everybody who will be watching the replays and those who will be listening to the podcast join us next time and most importantly thank you Lin Yi you've been fantastic I don't have words enough to explain how happy I am in this moment and since we've been talking for about food for about an hour now you're gonna have lunch I'm gonna have dinner because I'm in Europe and everybody Yes, please eat as well. Eat good food. Eat good food. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Online School of Food Design. It's been a pleasure, and I'm really elated to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.